Today is December 21st, 2023, and I want to encourage listeners to go to econtalk.org where you'll find a link for our annual poll of your favorite episodes. Please go there and vote. Thanks for voting and for providing feedback about the program. And now for today's guest, economist Noah Smith. His blog on Substack is No Opinion. That's Noah Opinion. N-O-A-H-P-I-N-I-O-N. This is Noah's third appearance on the program. He was last here in October of 2018 talking about worker compensation and market power. Noah, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thanks for having me back. It's great Our to topic be here. for today is the wealth of nations, not the book, uh, but the concept, although we may talk about the book a little bit. We're going to be referring to a recent essay at No Opinion that you wrote with the title, Nations Don't Get Rich by Plundering Other Nations. So uh, a lot of people would disagree with that, I think. So let's start with the idea of plunder. Uh, What do you think people have in mind when they explain the wealth of nations via plunder and what's wrong with it? Well, usually plunder talks about natural resources. So you have some ships, you have some guys with guns, you send the ships and the guys with guns to somewhere else and you say, hey, you know, we're in charge here. Now you're working for us in the mines. And um, and then you open up some mines and the local people, you know, mine the stuff for starvation wages or you just enslave them or whatever. And then you take the the metal or whatever resources or the rubber, whatever they've got, right? And then you cart it away to the metropole of empire where you use it to build monuments to your empire's greatness and things like that. I think that's the sort of the picture people have in their minds when you talk about colonial plunder. Um, This is, you know, it's a caricature, but it's, it's roughly accurate for the way, say, that the Spanish mined silver in South America. You had the encomienda system, which was essentially slavery. You had, uh, you know, actual literal slavery. Uh, you know, in mining, and a lot of it was just enforced by Spanish military power. Uh, you also had, in, in fact, this has actually been kind of a common thing for a lot of empires for thousands of years. You saw this kind of plunder, and um, and Spain didn't do it too differently. Um, when the British and French came along, they did it a little bit differently. They usually co-opted local elites um, and said, you know, hey, local guy, just, you know, sell us some stuff. And then the Um, And they would send some soldiers in to like make lay down some railroad tracks or occasionally execute people you don't like or put down a rebellion or something like that. But then the local elites would do, you know, a lot of the extracting, often with a sort of, you know, British and French engineering help. And they'd build some. But ultimately, it was not that different. You know, mines would get built and miners would get paid low wages or um, and, you know, plantations, rubber trees, you know, cut down, grown and cut down and all this stuff. And so, of course, some Marxists say, okay, labor is also a resource. So you're extracting labor. Fine, if you want. Uh, But then um, I thought, personally, I thought the idea of extraction itself just deals with the idea that you're also extracting labor. You're making someone do some stuff for you that they wouldn't have done on their own, uh, you know, if it was just like a perfect free market or whatnot. And so I think that's the that's kind of the idea of plunder. And there's absolutely no doubt that a lot of this did happen uh, throughout history and in the period of European colonialism. And, um, you know, it was a common thing. And so that's, I, I think, uh, did that answer your question? Well, and then, you know, a similar analysis is done with American economic activity in, say, Latin America or South America, where uh, United Fruit would exploit workers in picking bananas and other uh, natural natural resources. We had an episode um, related to this uh, tangentially, at least uh, in the Belgian Congo, which, is, which was a you know, horrific example of European exploitation of, of the local population and the, the stealing, which is what plunder is, the theft of both natural resources and to, mention, to a large extent often the lives or well-being of the people who lived in those places at the time. So the question is, uh, how important is that? So all that happened, and it, it's a horrible episode in in history, varying in intensity and horrificness. Um, 
all that happened. The question is, which you deal with in your essay, is is that the source of the wealth that Western Europe and uh, and say the United States uh, have attained? Is that where it came from? Is it basically a form of exploitation? And you argue no. Uh, you start with. We'll talk in a minute about the maybe the theory behind why no is the wrong answer. But let's start with the evidence. What evidence do you provide for why plunder is not really a good explanation for how nations uh, get wealthy? Right. Well, so the, the the first basic thing is just to look at the timing. Um, when you look at when nations got really rich, all like pretty much all of the enrichment has happened in the last uh, you know 150 years since you know maybe 1870 or so if you look at 1870 our uh you know ans the ancestors of you know people in the united states and britain uh pe people in the united states and britain were living very meager lives they were living lives that by modern standards are incredibly poor despite all the plunder that they had done all the you know military force they had applied and all the suffering they had inflicted you know, mass enslavement uh, for, you know, centuries and all kinds of, you know, wars and extraction and all this stuff, um, they were still incredibly poor by modern standards. And so basically this, this um, every, all the plunder that had happened before 1870 or so was essentially someone, uh, one poor person shooting another poor person for a tiny amount of money. So imagine that, you know, your neighbor has $40 to his name and that you have $40 to your name. Okay. So you're both really poor. You shoot your neighbor and take your neighbor's $40. Are you rich? Are you richer now that you shot your neighbor? Well, a tiny bit. Did you harm your neighbor? Well, absolutely. You shot him. Uh, did you plunder from your neighbor? Absolutely. You took his $40. Are you rich? No, you have $80 now. You're still a poor person. So this understanding relative versus absolute wealth is absolutely key to this idea. The idea that when we look around and we see all the, you know, the, um, the, the cars and the medical procedures and the skyscrapers and the TVs and all the cell phones and everything else we have that makes us rich, all the amazing food and cool furniture and all the other things that make us rich, those things are new. And people in 1870 did not have those things. Um, they had almost none of those things. And I, I've quoted uh, my um, Walter Williams. Uh, we probably, when I interviewed him a long time ago, we we probably uh, actually talked about this, so we'll link to that episode. But uh, from the way he would summarize it, which I find it, it it's similar to what you just said, but it has a, a an aspect I want to highlight. Uh, through most of human history, you got rich by knocking your neighbor on the head and taking your neighbor's stuff. Uh, right. That and, was and relatively way, rich. You wouldn't get. Well, you got. That was how you got water. richer. That was how you richer. got richer. Your Slightly point, richer. Is, yes. Your point, which is correct, is uh, that doesn't make you rich. It makes you a little bit richer. And the point I want to emphasize is that uh, that does not make the world richer. It it's a zero sum game uh, at that level. Plunder is almost by definition a zero sum game. It means you're neighbor in this case nationally it was what we're mainly going to be talking about your your national neighbor has stuff you now you have it uh and they don't so that does not transform the world it might help you a little bit as you point out not a lot uh through most of history but uh the point i want to emphasize is that it's actually not a zero-sum game it certainly at the personal level it's a negative sum game because the threat of plunder in the personal sphere causes you to spend resources you otherwise would prefer not to spend with better locks, better guns, better fences, whatever it is. And even worse than that, if you're if you're weak and you're at risk of being plundered by your neighbor, either personally or nationally, your incentive to grow and expand and innovate and do other things that might lead to actual real wealth is not so high because there's a risk of plunder. So all of that points to the fact that that plunder, which we think of as a zero sum game, is probably much more uh, correct to think of it as a negative sum game. And it was the way of the world for much, almost all of human history until just recently. And you quote, uh, it's a wonderful picture. You have a a uh, a chart from. Uh, from the work of Angus Madison. Angus Madison and his uh, colleagues 
work diligently to do at, as best as possible. It's, it's impossible, but they did the best they could in trying to measure, uh, going back in, in the case of your chart to 1820, what is the average uh, per capita, what is per capita GDP for various parts of the world? And what struck me about it is that until uh, about the middle of the 20th century, so forget 1870, until the middle of the 20th century, there really there was no part of the world that lived on more than $10,000 a year, a very, very low standard of living by our modern standards. Starting around 1930s and 40s, ironically, in the aftermath of the Great Depression, certainly starting in 1950, there is a remarkable, unparalleled acceleration of economic well-being in Western Europe, in uh in Western Europe's uh, similar countries, uh, or whatever you might call them, the United States, Canada, Australia, and so on. And then eventually even the other parts of the world also accelerate, not nearly as dramatically, not to as nearly as high a level, but there's basically a five-fold, four or five-fold improvement of standard of living in, the, in, the, in Western Europe and the United States, similar countries since 1950. Certainly since 1900, there's been a, a steady improvement as well. So if you want to understand how economic activity, material well-being can be transformed, you have to explain that. You have to explain two things. One, why it's relatively flat for most of human history, uh, and then why it suddenly, suddenly accelerates. And it can't really be plunder because – uh, there are no Martians to plunder. It, for the whole world, which whole world has gotten richer over the last 70 years, uh, you have to, there's no one to take it from. So something else really underlying and important has to be going on. Right. Yes. We know, you know, basically, we know how um, countries get rich because we've seen them do it again and again. Uh, you know, basically, we know what industrialization looks like, right? Um, and so, and we know what the requirements for that are. We know that modern scientific discoveries are absolutely key to industrialization, as well as a large accumulated amount of tacit knowledge about how to build industrial things. We can see where production comes from. Well, you can look at a factory. You can look at, you know, supply chains and, and where that, that stuff comes from. And you can see that we had all those natural resources before, you know, maybe we couldn't extract them, but they were in the ground. They were there. And we can see exactly the machines uh, and the inventions that allowed us to extract those natural resources, more, more of them than we could before. But most importantly, to, to process them into new forms of stuff. Now we can make a refrigerator before we could not. Now we can make a microphone before we could not. And we can see very concretely where all this wealth comes from. What's more, we can look at the historical uh, trajectories of countries that try to get rich mainly through plunder, and we can compare them to the historical trajectories of countries that try to get rich mainly through, um, you know, making industrial stuff. So, for example, when we look at Spain and Portugal, those countries now are, you know, somewhat rich as countries go, but they weren't always, they were, that's relatively recent and is based on, you know, their integration with the European economy. Before, in their colonial days, they did not get especially wealthy from plunder, even in the relative sense. The, their people remained desperately poor. And um, they, you know, they dug up all this gold and silver and other resources from, from Latin America and shipped them back to Europe, but ultimately frittered it away because they didn't really invest it for industrialization. They spent it on wars or like, you know, gilding the local church or whatever they had, right? Uh, they didn't really um they didn't really industrialize uh much and that was why spain and portugal stayed poor at the time britain is sort of the intermediate case but before we talk about britain i want to talk about germany which germany had a couple overseas colonies for a very short amount of time um very few and for a short amount of time and they weren't ultimately that important it was more of a vanity project for imperial germany uh germany became rich by making stuff in germany and they they became as rich as Britain. Um, uh, eventually, uh, now they're richer. But they 
they had no they had very little legacy of of colonial exploitation sweden switzerland denmark um you know these countries did not have a legacy a colonial empire and um now you look in the modern day you look at uh japan uh we had an empire um but south korea did not um right singapore certainly um taiwan was just this lonely little island uh and a number of countries like this are you know have, have basically gotten rich without ever having a colonial empire and at this point um so so we know that countries got rich without having their own colonial empires we know that countries that had their own colonial empires often did not get rich so it was neither necessary nor sufficient uh, to have a colonial empire in order to industrialize but we see that britain and france did and britain and france did have extensive colonial empires and the question is um you know did is, did that make them uh industrialized did that make them get rich was it the fact that they had colonial empires right and the um and the answer is we don't actually know because so there are there there are hypotheses that say um you know there is a hypothesis that says the reason britain industrialized was because it had uh cheap capital and expensive labor that you need to substitute capital for labor um if you, uh, in other words, if, if workers' wages are really, really high, but yet the price of of physical stuff, machinery, and commodities is very low, you need to use the machines instead of the humans. And then once they started using the machines, then they're like, oh wow, these machines are really great, and they start tinkering and improving and investing. So you then got this this you know industrial corporations got this virtuous cycle of investing in in better you know machinery and technology, and so um, that is an argument for why the industrial revolution was sparked. And a key part of that argument is the idea that cheap uh, resources from extraction, from colonies, made capital cheap and prompted um, uh, prompted business people in Britain to use machines instead of workers and to get used to using machines instead of workers, uh, you know, to expand. Of course, the workers' wages were eventually raised too, but... Um, so that that is an argument, and if you look at the work of, say, um, Robert Allen, it doesn't explicitly, you know, mention the flood of of resources. Well, I guess he does briefly, but then, um, but but that's implicit in his ideas. If you look at uh, uh, Pomeranz, uh, the Great Divergence, this, you know, he he talks about this as well. He doesn't put it in quite the same terms as Allen. So it is possible. It is possible that. What you that all you needed to start uh, industrialization that the reason the reason uh, that Song Dynasty China or the Roman Empire or uh, you know the early modern Netherlands never industrialized or India the reason these these people never industrialized is because they had cheap labor and they and business people would always do the short term thing of invest of using more and more cheap labor instead of in doing the difficult long term thing of investing in machines and that all it took was for one country to have a you know this massive influx of cheap stuff from the colonies um in order for for uh prices the, the price of switching to machinery to go way down and that that was the magic spark that started the industrial revolution. Now, this is a theory. I will say that I've looked at some of the evidence for the theory and it's highly inconclusive. Um, but it might be true. It might be that that had Britain not had a colonial empire, it would not have industrialized. And if Britain hadn't industrialized, maybe no one would have industrialized. And then maybe we wouldn't have an industrial society today and we would still be de all desperately poor in the world. And so according to this theory, the British Empire's resource exploitation of the world is what is what saved the human race from desperate poverty, and that all of our all of our vast wealth now can be owed to the you know perhaps butterfly effect, you know it, it, it's it's sure. it's a chain this this lengthy chain of causation from you know Britain goes and conquers some people and extracts the resources all the way to now we're rich yay. And the world doesn't have to starve and you know have bed bugs anymore. And so there is that argument. And I've looked and I'm not sure, you know, I, I think we don't really know. Um, but that that's what the argument is saying. I don't I don't want to find that persuasive for a lot of reasons, but I, I want to dig deeper into the into the you know, economic ideas behind it. 
And I just would mention that, of course, many places that have cheap labor today have industrialized, have added a lot of capital, have added machinery, have raised the standard of living of their workers dramatically through the use of capital. Uh, so this this has a certain uh, psychological aspect to it, at least the way you've portrayed it. I don't I find a little bit strange, which is like, oh, we didn't we didn't like that. We couldn't look forward far enough. Uh, but I think the more interesting question is is just the theoretical one, which is the role of resources and their price in both our well-being and in the opportunities to grow. Uh, let's let's talk about the United States for a minute. A lot of people say, well, of course, the United States is rich, and and, and why? Well, they have these oceans, the Atlantic and Pacific, protecting them maybe from from attack. Of course, not from the north and the south, but fine. In general, the United States has been blessed with lots of security at relatively low cost. And it has so many natural resources. Yes, it does. It's a big place. <laughs> it has a lot of different things. Uh, they're not easy to extract, as you alluded to at one point. Oil, for example, wasn't thought of as a resource. It became one when people were clever enough to figure out how to refine it and use it to create create energy. But but the, the idea that your colony is an, an economic advantage because you can steal their stuff, and let's call it that, not – Let's talk about pure plunder, not buying things cheaply, not paying workers very little, stealing, just taking. You send your army, they grab the stuff. Well, that's an advantage. Uh, the army, of course, is not free, and it's not as cheap as it looks. But, yes, it's nice to have stuff that you don't have to pay for. That does not make you wealthy. It is a um, – you know, it goes back to your example of you bang your neighbor on the head and take 40 bucks from them. You now have 80 bucks this year. When that money's gone, you have to find another neighbor. If you want to get wealthier and stay wealthy, and by wealthy, I mean have a higher standard of living materially. If you want to do that, you have to find more and more neighbors to bang over the head. And that's not a very uh, – realistic description of how, how the world works th through most of its history. And so part of what I'm trying to allude to here is that some of the confusion here is about uh, what we might call what – what is called in economic stocks versus flows, things at a point in time versus things that persist over time, growth, material well-being, persistent material well-being, persistent material well-being that's widespread across a vast swaths of the population. That requires – Growth, not just more stuff today. It means more stuff today, tomorrow, the day after. That requires a change in the underlying process of how stuff is created. And you focused on industrialization, but more generally, it means you have to find ways to get more from less. You have to find ways that uh, what we would call productivity, innovation. And, and last, I just want to emphasize the point you made about uh, Portugal and Spain. Uh, very much in line with The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Adam Smith made the point that gold and silver, there are things, and they, they are good for gilding churches and, and uh, filling cavities for, for some of human history. So they're not useless, but they're not the source of true wealth. And, and Smith was a radical voice in 1776 when he said, you don't get wealthy by taking a bunch of silver, raw metals that – you now have more of those things and you have some dollar or pound or peso uh, number associated with them. That does not transform the standard of living of your people. It means you have more stuff in your warehouse that's not actually making life richer in any material sense. And so I think that inside of economics, that uh, growth requires a transformation in how stuff is produced, as you point out, but it's not just industrial. It's all kinds of aspects uh, of, of modern life. That's the source of material well-being, not just getting some things cheaply. Getting things cheaply helps. That's pleasant. It improves you. As you say, through most of human history, not so much. But to have a transformation that is ongoing requires a whole process of how things get improved over time. Exactly. And right, that's right. And so the unsophisticated sort of argument that you see, you know, pushed by pseudonymous doofuses on the on social media who may or may not be, you know, teenagers living in like Pakistan or something. Um, the unsophisticated argument is that basically America's wealth 
and the wealth of like Europe and Japan, whatever, is right now based on an ongoing transfer of resources from poor nations. That is obviously silly. The more the, there are two more sophisticated versions of the argument that people, you know, who just have thought about it for more than five seconds and uh, you know, come up with. Um, I do want to. I do just want to point out that the phrase pseudonymous pseudonymous doofuses I think has never been uttered on econ talk before so that's this is that's very nice. continue carry on now what are, what are the slightly more sophisticated versions <laughs> right the slightly the real name doofuses um what the, <laughs> shame on you <laughs> shame on me or the doofuses uh, all of us well, that's a, we'll see <laughs> all of us um because we're all just addicted to social media which is to all of our shame but anyway um so the, the one more sophisticated argument is the one I just said, the idea that all this stuff jump-started uh, you know, economic development. There's also a, a popular argument that even made it into the New York Times uh, in the 1619 Project that slavery was responsible for the Industrial Revolution. That has been pretty much debunked by now. Um, but it's a widely held belief, and I think we should spend a little bit of time. I was going to ask you about it. Okay. I think yeah. it, uh, it is a widely held belief that the opportunity to enslave people – uh, is the source not of the well-being of Southern plantation older, holders in 1833, but of America's well-being today. That right, the legacy right. of slavery is is, and of course this leads to uh, arguments for the justice of reparations and other issues. But just t let's take that on its face. What's wrong with that argument? Well, so. The first thing is that the research underlying this idea is of poor quality and has been essentially debunked. The historical scholarship, um, basically, so so Ed Baptist is a historian, and he Ed Baptist claimed after looking through some archival sources that at some point in the history of the American South, American slave owners. Uh, discovered new methods of horrific torture, which he never specified, but posited must exist, discovered new methods of horrific torture by which they could force slaves to work far longer and faster, basically torturing them much worse and make, you know, increasing their, their output. And that this led to, you know, massive multiples of, of increase in the cotton production. And that that cheap cotton was what caused the Industrial Revolution uh, in Britain. Um, that th there's no evidence for such a torture system at all. No one knows what it was. He just made up the idea that some sort of thing like that must have existed. And when you look at the evidence, it, tur it turns out it's very clear that increases in cotton production came from the introduction of better types of cotton. Like we know what they are. We know when it happened. So essentially this, this historical scholarship, which is based on long chains of, of supposition backed by kind of, you know, well, ideology, is wrong. Uh, that's not what happened. Um, the idea that, um, the idea that uh, slave, um, the slavery system made cotton cheaper at all is highly questionable because Indian cotton was was extremely cheap as well. And now, of course, you could say, well, Indian workers were exploited as well. Well, that may be true. Um, but it, there doesn't seem to be have been anything particularly unique about slavery and its ability to make cotton cheap. It primarily uh, enriched slave owners at the expense of other people. And now we've got some new research by um, Hornbeck and Logan. Uh, that's Richard Hornbeck and Trevin Logan. Um, who have done basically? They show they they um, they theorize and show evidence consistent with the idea that uh, slavery made regions poorer. When you extracted wealth from people by enslaving them, you distorted your economy in all sorts of ways. Now, uh, you know this this should be. This should be music to sort of an old libertarian's ears, such as yourself. But the idea is basically, um, you know, when you enslave people, they can't develop human capital. They can't, um, you know, basically there's there's massive wedges, but you know, efficiency wedges that essentially you're you're having a huge percent of your population that you're just not 
actually exploiting. You're exploiting in the sense of robbing them of their labor and, and freedom. You're not exploiting them in the sense of actually, you know, the society isn't getting their full potential. Um, yeah, I, and so, I, I want to emphasize two things. First, yeah. that none of this is to minimize the horror of slavery. It's of evil or it's it's uh, right. human uh, depravity. The, exactly. The, the fundamental issue here, which is very hard to talk about, I think, uh, in um, – it's just hard to talk about and be respectful of those issues. Uh, the question, though, is does it – how does it enrich the uh, the nation that has slaves? So I, I want to take a step back and look at the um, underlying economics again. It is an enormous advantage to have a form of inexpensive labor. Uh, especially if they don't live where you live or if you treat them as if they're not part of your your, your group. Uh, low prices are good for economic well-being, whether it's labor, uh, inputs that we've been talking about that you might steal. Th those are all an advantage. Um, well, not necessarily, Russ. Well, it depends what it not costs to get them. Prices, price, yeah. <laughs> prices should equal marginal costs. If prices are below marginal costs, it's not an advantage. Fair enough, because they would encourage you to over over – maybe overuse them. Divert too many resources toward this and take the resources yeah, away from where enough. they need to go. So you introduce a distortion. So you don't want prices that are too low, you know? No, no. But I just meant uh, if, if you think about your capabilities as a nation or as a human being, as an individual, in general, it's nice to have access to stuff that is cheaper rather than more expensive. Uh, yes, it can change your choices in ways that might not be good for you in all kinds of com complex social and moral and emotional ways, but in general, the way you get richer is by expanding your opportunities as, an, as a nation or as an individual, which comes from effectively lowering the prices of stuff uh, and, and having thereby more access to, to that stuff. The, the point I want to make is that uh, the ultimate cheap labor is a machine. <laughs> Because a machine is a form of labor that doesn't get tired, generally. It gets a little tired. It has to be maintained. But it's different than a human being. But fundamentally, they're somewhat interchangeable in the economic process. The advantage of a machine is that you can make it more productive. Uh, you can make, uh, you know, the examples I used to use, which I used to know off the top of my head. I don't know them anymore. But if you have a group of people sitting in a room with knitting needles, they can make a certain number of sweaters a year. If you give them a loom, they can make more sweaters per year, or they can make the same number with many fewer workers. If you give them a modern technological weaving process, the numbers go through the roof. And this is really the fundamental idea in the wealth of nations, when you think about the division of labor, what Smith points out at the very beginning in his example of the pin factory is that, you know, once you have processes in place where you've substituted some machinery for some human labor, you can innovate, which is ironic because in 1776, there wasn't that much innovation. But he saw right. it. It's he kind saw, of amazing that Adam Smith got this right before yeah, it happened. Like, exactly. He didn't it, really understand, stunning, like, you know, insight. scientific, blah, 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 you know, sort of like, uh, you know, industrial labs and machinery and stuff. But but he understood that, like, productivity improvements of some sort could exist. And and so my point about the work of Ed Baptist, whose work I don't know, and I'm, I'm only talking about it through your lens and, and taking it on its face. So it's not a criticism of, uh, of him. It's a criticism of your summary of him, which could be accurate. And I'm going to assume for now it is, is that, you can't torture people more and more to get ever greater output from them. But you can do that to a machine, not because the machine doesn't feel pain, but because the machine has opportunities for human creativity and improvements in productivity that human beings are limited because we're physical in a different way than machines are. And again, this is nothing to say about the cruelty of, of you know, of, of driving human beings to produce without pay and or, or horrible standards of living and the exploitation of human beings and the limiting of their freedom. It's grotesque. It's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is just the opportunity to use that technique to get richer and richer, to have growth, not just a one-time transfer of 
uh, of the kind of wealth we're talking about via plunder. And it just isn't there. It's not the way that the world got wealthy. All these explanations are basically uh, having to argue that this jump-starting idea that, that somehow we had to kick it off with this with some of these uh, these processes. I'm much ha happier saying it was the steam engine uh, and, and the innovation of uh, the ability to substitute uh, mechanical labor through machines and and capital, and and thereby surpass wildly the the limits of of human physical limitation. Uh, you know, another way to think about this is a person can walk, they can walk quickly, they can run, they cannot run a horse <laughs> uh, over any uh, uh, most distances, and they'll never outrun a car. Uh, it. it unless the car has no no fuel. The ability of human beings to create ever faster and more effective forms of transportation is, is an extraordinary thing. And it's about surpassing our physical limitations. Those limitations are unavoidable. And our ability to surpass them with our brains is the reason we're fundamentally wealthier today than we were 50 and 100 years ago. Correct. This is obviously true from anyone who knows how machines work or who traces the, you know, inputs of a modern production process, which, of course, the pseudonymous doofuses on Twitter uh, do not. <laughs> but, yes. Um, so that's exactly right. And um, we found a better way of making people rich in the Industrial Revolution. Um, you know, I, I'm agnostic on whether machines pain maybe chat gpt uh just is really pissed about being asked to do the same homework set yet one more time but but general who cares do the problem set chat gpt <laughs> um, but then um but yeah so so we use machines instead of of humans but it took people a really really long time to understand this and i would argue that it's not until relatively like just the last few decades that this lesson has really started to sink in because you could you still saw people trying to conquer their neighbors and take their resources in fact some people still think about doing this you see venezuela proposing to invade and, and you know and conquer part of uh, guiana over this you know oil rich uh territory that lies between them so you know because venezuela is this economic basket case and things hmm, maybe we could make a buck by by invading conquering our neighbor hmm uh, they can't. Brazil will probably stop them because the only way for their troops to actually get there because of the mountainous or whatever mountainous, it, it's very difficult to pass region, is to go through Brazil and Brazil will not let them do that. So they won't be able to do it. But the fact that they're thinking about it is an indication that this particular form of stupidity has not vanished from the earth. And the idea that you can get rich by simply knocking over your neighbor and taking some of their rocks. Yeah, I, the other thing I want to emphasize and uh, encourage listeners to go back, we'll link to them, uh, uh, at least one, if not more, uh, conversations we had with Paul Romer a long time ago. Um, we're talking about substituting machines for people. And again, I think it's very common for people to think, well, that'll be hard on the people because the machines will get all the work. That is not the way the last 75 years of industrialization and growth have turned out. The people got the benefits. You know, the word capitalist is, is it, we don't think about it very much, but it it's comes from capital, <laughs> meaning the owners of the machines, the owners of the factory. So uh, the substitution of capital and machinery for human beings certainly can make the capitalist, the owner of the machine wealthy, but it did something else unexpected. It made, perhaps, it made the workers who worked with the machines and who lived alongside the machines wealthy as well, because it made them wealthier. It, it excuse me, made them more productive. Uh, machinery, which is a human creativity embodied in the physical world, machinery makes our standard of living higher. And it's not just the people who own the machines. It's most of the people in the countries that have chosen that path. And that's uh, not intuitive, I think. And it's one of the great gifts of economics to understand that. Right. And you really, that starts with the wealth of nations, but it is a consistent strain. What I'm saying is nothing new. There's nothing new in what I'm saying. 
Uh, I have no new insight on this topic. I'm simply, you know, using new words to restate an idea that's been around for a very, very long time and is still correct. Uh, but it's it's important to say it it bears saying over and over and over. And the reason is because the reason we need to say it now is because we are entering a very scary time in world uh, geopolitics. The reason being that America's longstanding hegemony has uh, ended. We are no longer a hegemon in the world. Um, we are still a powerful country. There's lots of stuff we can do, but we are no longer a global hegemon or even the hegemon of half the world as we were in the Cold War because other countries grew. Other countries got more powerful. Our power became less relatively overwhelming. You know, it's not because we got worse or weaker. We we got weaker in some ways, but but mostly it is by, because countries like China grew, um, in particular China grew and weapons change so that small militias like the Houthis can now get drones and missiles and, you know, create outsized amounts of uh, power projection and chaos. And so because of various changes in technology and in globalization and in economic development and all these things, the United States can no longer really be the hegemon it was in the 20th century. And because of this, conflicts are starting to break out and the kind of quasi-enforcement of national borders that the United States provided in the years after World War II is now breaking down. You see Venezuela threatening to invade Guyana. You see uh, Azerbaijan threatening to invade Armenia. You see Putin actually invading Ukraine. You see China threatening to invade Taiwan and grab little pieces of India, et cetera. Um, and so you see a number of these, these cases where essentially the idea of we could take over our neighbor, we could march our army in and take over part of our neighbor are starting to appear again. And it is important. Now, now I don't think simply pointing out that this is not a good strategy for getting rich will deter anyone. I don't think that this will work because, you know, China doesn't, Taiwan, doesn't want Taiwan because they think they can capture TSMC and make some nice semiconductors. They can't. Right, TSMC will wipe the servers, blow up the plants, and just leave. Um, nor does Russia really think they can get rich from the wheat fields of Ukraine. Um, maybe Venezuela is desperate enough that they think they that that knocking over Guyana would make them a little extra bucks. But I don't think really so. And there's nothing there's nothing economically strategic between China and India really. Um, nothing nothing major. Um, so, so I don't think these people really believe that conquest will make them rich. So I don't, but it's important to remind people that getting rich is a thing you can do and you can focus on peaceful development. You can focus on improving your citizens standard of living without beating up anyone, without buying a big army full of giant missiles and, and, you know, marching into neighbor's territory and telling them what to do and saying, we rule you now, ha ha ha, or, you know, like you you don't really need to do that. Economic development is more important than that stuff. And not everyone agrees. Some people think, oh, our honor demands that we attack. Some people have ethnic motivations like, oh, you speak the same language as us and therefore we should rule you. You know, there's the, or historical, you know, like we're so mad that like, this piece of our country like broke off, you know, like Ukraine broke off from Russia. We're so mad about how this diminished our greatness. And then um, there's many reasons to fight, but it's important to remind people that none of these things will make you rich. Um, none of these things, uh, th these things won't really benefit your people, except in some sort of intangible benefit of bloodthirst, if you think that that's real bloodthirst and national greatness and historical revenge and then like shut up just do something you know just just develop your country and make people happy and live a happy life rich and happy life just do that and mm -hmm. i think that reminding people that national wealth doesn't come from plunder is a is an important thing in this new jungle-like geopolitical environment we find ourselves in to remind people that there is a better more peaceful way so I want to take that um, transformation of the role that nationalism is playing in, in modern psychology, at least in many places, and I want to tie it to what we've been talking about in a different way. So we've, we've been talking most of this time about plunder, colonialism, exploitation of resources, or slavery. Uh, there's a more sophisticated version of this argument 
that we've not really talked about, which is globalization. Globalization, which is the uniting of the disparate peoples of the world through trade and through the reduction in transportation costs, the miraculous and glorious ability to move stuff around the world much more cheaply than we did before, which is part of the industrial transformation we did already discuss. But what that has led to is an enormous changes in where things are made and their price and so on. And also those things take place in a over time way. They don't just mean that things are cheaper to, today relative to yesterday. They get ever cheaper. We find ever cheaper ways to transport things. The whole idea of a cargo container and, and, and the way modern shipping is done is, was a huge, huge change that, that's, I think, underappreciated. But a lot of people believe that globalization is a form of exploitation. They believe that the increased trade among the nations of the world, which is enormously larger today than it was, say, 50 years ago, is a form of exploitation that certain nations benefit from it and other nations are harmed. Uh, now, what is true is that within a country, certain people may not be helped by globalization in the short run. Uh, they may have skills that are now less competitive and rewarded at lower rates, and they will have a harder time. And that fuels resentment, and it, and it fuels a form of economic nationalism that uh, is widely uh, out there right now uh, in the United States and elsewhere. But I think it's important to point out that in the long run, and I don't mean a thousand years from now, I mean, part of the reason that fewer human beings starve to death uh, around the world and why many human beings have higher standards of material well-being is because they can trade with their neighbors when they more cheaply than they could in the past. And so I, I want to hear your thoughts on, on that aspect of this, uh, this argument. Well, so obviously that's really important. The question is, is that now under threat? And I would say that most people, when they talk about threats to trade, talk about protectionism. Um, I don't think that's nearly as big a threat to trade as people think, because protectionism is a lot easier said than done. If you put tariffs on a country, exchange rates will just, you know, appreciate and depreciate until it cancels out much of the tariff that you put. Um, I think that the biggest threat is from the breakdown of global order, because freedom of the seas Freedom of trade and freedom of the seas is, has been guaranteed by the United States Navy and, you know, allied navies. And uh, that could really break down. Most of the most of the trade in the world is is by sea. You know, we, we put stuff on a boat, the boat floats, so it's low friction, and then you just give it a little nudge and it goes across the sea, and then you can move really heavy stuff, you know, from place to place very cheaply. And so the giant container ships we always see. Um, or, or the oil tankers, whatnot, um, that is under threat from breakdown of freedom of the seas. So right now, we're seeing the Houthis, which are, you know, what's Houthi? It's, it's, a, it's a militia in Yemen. It's not a very power. Yemen is not a rich state at all. It's not a very powerful state. But you have a very warlike militia located at this strategic point, um, you know, where the, um, uh, the, the Red Sea uh, empties into the um, the the Indian Ocean, and that carries a ton of commerce. A ton of ships go through the Suez Canal, and then and then you know get out into the Indian Ocean, go to Asia. So massive trade between Asia and Europe happens through the Suez Canal and through the Red Sea. That is now being interdicted by the Houthis, this ragtag militia with a few missiles. That's just a taste. That's a preview of what's to come. China claims the entire waters of the South China Sea and will be perfectly happy to interdict trade by anyone other than China if they feel like it. You know, they, they want power and dominance over people and restricting maritime trade is an easy way to get that if you control the sea around your region. Um, so we can see threats to seaborne trade happening, obviously threats to, to digital trade, although that's much smaller. Um, and then threats to landborne trade from, you know, an airborne trade, that's also pretty small. Uh, but, but threats to landborne trade from basically land wars like the Ukraine war. 
I am worried about that more than I'm worried about tariffs or something like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's a you know related issue of of free uh, movement of peoples across borders. Uh, well, trade is generally thought of as movement of goods across borders, but immigration is is a um, an example of a more complicated trade flow that brings other things with it. And, and of course, we've had many, many episodes on this. We'll link to, to some of them. But what's interesting to me is that the standard economic forces that economists like us have been talking about for decades are suddenly seen as less important. They're being dwarfed by national and tribal uh, impulses, which is much more understandable in the case of of my immigration and emigration. It's much more, I think, um, I think the impulse to economic nationalism is a very destructive one. Immigration, I think, is more complicated, but the idea of, of tariffs and quotas and the idea of preserving your country's well-being is, I think, a, just a total misreading of the economic um, tea leaves while conceding that for certain groups that economic trade can be harmful or challenging in the short run and that the political implications of that I think are not small. So I, I disagree with you a little bit. I think the risks of, of economic nationalism motivated by uh, groups that, that feel harmed correctly or not by trade and who do not easily reintegrate into a different part of the into the economy because they don't have the educational training that they could have had. That is a serious force that I think is is really uh, unhealthy for for well being and and economic policy. Right, and so so if we're talking about immigration restriction, I think we need to be fairly um, we need to put that in a bit of perspective because immigration is much more common now than it was even just a few years ago. We. If, if immigration gets restricted, it will be restricted from an incredibly high base, historically speaking. If you go back to 1990 or 2005 or whatever, and immigration were all the world over was much, 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 much less than it is now. And part of that is because of some wars, like the war in Syria that caused refugee flows, but most of it is simply due to growth. So if you read the, you know, migration and the income and migration literature, you know, Michael Clemens has a good survey paper on it. You'll see a hump-shaped pattern where uh, in a poor country, people can't move. In a rich country, people don't want to move. But in, but in a middle-income country, they both want to and can move. And so there's a peak of out-migration pressure. And that peak is somewhere around $10,000 a person per capita. Now, if you look, a lot of the world's less than that. But a lot of the world has just reached that you know, very recently. And that is giving them the ability to move. Now, this is not the only factor. There's a lot of other factors like fertility rates, which have dropped and continue to drop pretty much everywhere. And um, and then, um, but what we've seen is, you know, the, the current waves of migration are not being driven by climate refugees, as many people have predicted. It is not, it isn't, a little bit of it is being driven by war. Some of it's being driven by war, but most of it's being driven by income people are able to move in a way that they were previously not able at all to move. And so they are moving. And so when you talk about immigration restriction, you're talking about, you know, it went up, 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 and now restriction threatens to do that to it. But still, it will be way up from where it was 10 years ago, 15 years ago, way up. And so I'm concerned about this for sure. But I'm not panicking yet simply because immigration continues to go up so far. Well, let's close and talk about what, you know, is the um, one of the most extraordinary achievements in, um, in economic well-being in human history, which is the transformation of standard of living in the two largest countries of the world, China and India. Um, in many ways, you know, if you look at, say, Asian data and even world data about, say, the the proportion of the world that lives on less than a dollar a day or two dollars a day, or if you look at average standard of living or in the world, which has been steadily improving over the last 50 to 100 years, uh, a lot of it's driven by two data points, uh, China and India. The rest of the world's 
is growing, but they're growing so much faster than than most other places. Um, what do you think we should learn from that? Uh, I, what, I would issue a small caveat there. I would yeah, say that ahead. Southeast Asia has also experienced extremely substantial growth. True. We're talking about Indonesia, Vietnam. Yep. Th these countries are not super giants on their own, but they add up to quite a lot across the region. Fair enough. Um, but so I would say China, India, and Southeast Asia. It's basically Asia that is growing. So what do we learn from that? What should we learn from it? Well, you know, a couple things. Um, obviously, China and India experienced big spurts of growth when they liberalized their economies. China in the uh, 80s, and then later with a big wave of privatizations in the 90s and 2000s. Um, and India, primarily in the 90s, uh, also a little bit in the 80s, but primarily in the 90s. Um, liberalization uh, really helped these countries a lot. Explain what you mean by liberalization. Explain what you mean by liberalization, Noah. So liberalization took a number of forms. In China, the original wave of liberalization under Deng basically meant allowing people to buy and sell stuff, just allowing markets. The later waves of liberalization under Hu, uh, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao were primarily uh, privatization. Um, essentially, SOEs were privatized and a bit of uh, some state owned enterprises. That's right. State-owned enterprises, government-owned companies were privatized. That has been that is is starting to reverse under Xi Jinping. Um, we are seeing uh, state state-owned enterprises um, grow at the expense of at least nominally private enterprise now in China. But for a long time, we saw the exact opposite, and there was just just relentless campaigns under uh, Zhang, especially, but also somewhat Hu Jintao to privatize, privatize, privatize. Um, and it really, it was very successful. That didn't mean that the government no longer controlled these companies because the Chinese government, if, if they want you to do something, you're going to do it. Um, <clears throat> you could even say the same about Amer the American government, but, but in terms of the initiative of, of what to produce and when to produce it and, you know, et cetera, all that stuff, the, the decisions on a day-to-day -day basis were now being made by independent people with a lot of financial incentives to grow their businesses. And so that um, there were some other things too. For example, China established a lot of SEZs, special economic zones that had a lot of that had really low taxes. Uh, by the way, if you want, a, a, if you like low taxes, if you're a low tax person, you should love China. China has been a low tax country since imperial days, since hmm. for at least a thousand years, they have been a notoriously low tax country. And this is sometimes come back to bite them. But if you like low taxes, in fact, one reason China's in trouble now from its economic slowdown is we should we could talk about this another time, is because uh, real estate sales were used in lieu of taxes to fund government services. And now that real estate is going down in price that and, and no one wants to buy the land from the local governments, they can't fund their stuff. So they're low tax. The fact they don't do property taxes coming back to bite them. But anyway, so that was what it was in China. In India, I, the the main liberalization under financial finance minister Manmohan Singh um, was to um, dismantle what they called the license raj, which is basically just a bunch of red tape for starting businesses. Basically, India made it easier to start businesses. Um, they never really, you know, had a communist like you know price control central planning system, but they had a, like a massive thicket of regulations of this and that, and they just slashed through a lot of them. So it's primarily deregulation. India has made some special economic zones, but it's not just not nearly as extensive as China. So it's not really low taxes. I just want to put a footnote on the Sorry? China discussion and you can let you respond to it. The part of the problem is we don't really have a good understanding of the Chinese data. Um, there may not be 100% accurate. Um, underlying a lot of these changes was a massive hundreds of millions of people, hundreds of millions of people leaving the countryside and coming to the cities in search of better economic opportunity that, that, that started. And that transformation certainly improved the material well-being of the people who migrated but it's a little deceptive because they went from non-market activity that wasn't probably well measured at all to economic activity that was better measured. So the size of the change was probably overstated. And then finally, 
they're not exactly a market economy. There, there is some more privatization, but there's still, as you say, a lot of top-down control. And defenders of that will say that's the real reason that they have had a higher standard of living. And I would suggest that that's the real reason they may struggle to maintain it. I'm, you know, I'm very. I agree um, with you. No, go ahead. I agree with you. I think you're right. Um, that the the increasing that liberalization and privatization was the biggest driver of China's growth in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, and um, uh, and that that Xi's reversal of this will not go well, especially because Xi, I think, is sort of a bumbler. Um, he's not incredibly competent. He's very, very good at sort of controlling China and riding herd on the Communist Party and, you know, in getting everyone to study Xi Jinping thought and blah, blah, blah. He's great at, at, at domination, internal domination. He's bad at doing anything with that domination to actually help the people of China. Belt and Road has been a flop. The crackdown on IT companies was a giant flop and was reversed. Uh, real estate's an absolute disaster. Um, and he's just made various other errors as well, uh, economically. Um, and so, if, you know, he has his his worshippers like, she has made China strong, but they're wrong. Um, China was made strong by the efforts of Deng Xiaoping and his handpicked successors, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao. They're the ones who made China strong. Xi Jinping then came and basically appropriated their success, you know, rose to dominance in the system they created and has been eroding a lot of the fundamental strengths of the system he was bequeathed by Deng and his successors. Deng is the great man of Chinese history. Uh, let's close with um, how optimistic or pessimistic you are. It always, um, I always find it extraordinary that the worst economic times, which in the 20th century and in America were, was the Great Depression, and in the 21st century in America was the financial crisis of 2008. Uh, they tend to look like blips uh, as you pull back farther and farther from the canvas. And that's um, amazing. And I think it tends to lead us to believe that there's something natural about economic growth. Uh, Economists like to often, at least the ones I know, often will point out, no, 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 poverty is natural. <laughs> uh, growth is unusual. Growth is what's to be explained, not poverty, because poverty is, that's easy. That's when you just sit around and don't do anything differently. <laughs> so uh, given the somewhat cheering picture of when you stand uh, back from the canvas, even the worst of times seem to be uh, overcome, are you optimistic about the future of, of economic well-being in the United States and elsewhere and its ability to continue to grow? I am. I am. I am optimistic. I, I think that the the long upward trend is not universal. I think, um, you know, Japan's living standards have stagnated. Italy's have stagnated. Uh, Britain's are starting to stagnate as well. So um, I do not think that this is a universal tendency. Um, in terms of natural, I'm, I won't hazard to say what is natural and what is unnatural because I, I'm not sure what that means. And it would take a long time to think carefully <laughs> about all the things that that might mean. Yeah. But I'm very optimistic. I'm optimistic for a number of reasons. Number one, technology seems to be going strong. We are still investing in, you know, research and development costs a lot more than it used to. But we're still making those investments by and large. And, uh, we, you know, there's just any number of fields in which innovation is proceeding apace. Like um, the dramatic... Uh, decline in the cost of solar power and batteries is an absolute victory uh, for, for research and technological progress and is going to give us cheap energy and, and for the batteries, portable energy in a way that we've never really had before. Um, and of course, if fusion works out, then that will be just magnified even more. And um, and so that's incredible. Biotech is advancing in ways that are so multifarious and uh, and and cool and complex that it's difficult for me to even describe it, but we're about to have vaccines for cancer. That's just one little piece of what's what's happening in, in biotech. Um, humans are being genetically engineered. That's pretty cool. Uh, we have we have um, antibodies for um, like inflammatory bowel disease now and migraines. You can take an antibody for migraines. I did take it. I took it. It worked. Um, it's great. Uh, that's amazing. And 
AI is pretty cool. We have computers that can at least seem like they think. And, um, and so that's all just amazing stuff. So that's one reason. The second reason is that I think globalization isn't done. I think there's a huge wave of globalization coming and it's South and Southeast Asia. It is 2 billion people, which is bigger than China. It is India, yes, also Bangladesh, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, and a few other countries, but it's primarily those countries. That is huge. Together, though, that's like about 2 billion people. Um, India is now the most populous country in the world. It's surpassed China, which is now shrinking. And that, and now, uh, you know, you may be, you may be worried that, um, that decoupling and de-risking are, are distorting our trade by, you know, oh no, we're, we're, having a trade war with China, but really decoupling and de-risking are all private initiatives so far uh, because countries are realizing the real risks of doing business in China. Uh, companies are realizing the real risks of doing business in China and countries too, of course. And so people are getting out and where are they going? They're going to uh, South and Southeast Asia. They're going to the rest of Asia. And that is going to spur a massive wave of globalization. Foreign investors will be replaced in China by, by Chinese companies, uh, you know, that may be a bit less efficient, but they'll be, re they'll be replaced. But mean, but the foreign investment that pours into India and Indonesia and Vietnam and Philippines and Bangladesh and these countries, that is going to teach the, them so much technology about how to make stuff. And it is going to influence the progress of institutions in those countries because country those countries are going to realize hey if we change our institutions in this and this and that way to to be favorable to these foreign businesses then we'll make more money because this is how we make money now and the, we've seen this example happen time and time again we've seen countries like poland and malaysia not just get vaulted into the ranks of developed nations by primarily by fdi we've seen their institutions improve foreign direct at, investment Foreign direct investment, yes. We've seen institutions improve uh, along with it, especially like Poland, which is just now has effectively Western European institutions. Um, and so I'm incredibly optimistic about the the progress, about this wave of globalization. So technology and globalization. And I also believe that this the same innovation will prevent us, will save us not from any negative environmental impacts from climate change, but from the worst impacts. I think that there's a lot of people who are doomers about uh, climate. And if you look at the evidence, there's just, that's not warranted. The, the doomerism is just absolutely not warranted. So that's not gonna derail us. The thing I worry about is war. The thing I worry about is great power war, especially nuclear war. Um, war between China and the United States would be the absolute most catastrophic, but Russia, you can't count them out. Um, and so I'm, I'm worried about that disrupting global trade, disrupting global investment, uh, redirecting the progress of technology toward things that kill people. Although, you know, in World War II, we did that and then we built civilian industries after the war using some of those advances. But still, um, you know, I'm, I'm worried about what war could do to our world. I think we became a little complacent after World War II because World War, the, the end of World War II was favorable to global growth and really supercharged global growth, but war doesn't have to end like that. War can end in a bad way that hurts global growth. Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm worried about it, uh, especially if the nukes come out. So that's, I think, the big risk. But other than that, I'm really optimistic. My guest today has been Noah Smith. Noah, thanks for being part of EconTalk. Thanks so much for having me back. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.